The 18th of May, Gosport. The engines were fired up and off we went. Our feelings of trepidation were intense as we began our travels through the familiar waters of the Solent and the East Channel. However, the excitement levels were in overdrive. How was I going to survive 2,000 miles in confined quarters with this over-enthusiastic bundle of pure energy? Would we be able to resist killing each other? It would be a true test of friendship. The course was via the Outer Hours Buoy and directly along the coast to Eastbourne, passing the massive Rampian Wind Farm, which produces enough energy for 350,000 East Sussex homes. Later, we passed the magnificent Seven Sisters, leading to the famous Beachy Head and its lighthouse. A few miles further up the track is the entrance to Sovereign Harbour. The passage made arrival sound Not forgetting the at six The 19th of May, Eastbourne, Sovereign Harbour. Our send-off was well attended by our families, friends and many noisy children. It was a relief to get going before one of the youngsters fell in. The visibility was excellent in slightly choppier seas and what was anyway a line of sight navigational exercise, mostly headland to headland until the sharp turn to port having passed Dover Harbour on the final leg to Ramsgate itself. 20th of May, Royal Ramsgate Marina. Leaving Ramsgate turned out to be a very unpleasant experience with the short and very steep waves on the nose. Today I realise how different motorboating is from sailing. With Phil's masterly helming, we managed to turn around and head back to a very welcoming Ramsgate. 21st of May, Royal Ramsgate Marina. We had about an hour's run time to Lowestoft when the weather suddenly picked up, then picked up a bit more. This resulted in us reducing the displacement speed for the final 10 miles or so. A long hour passed by when, at last, we reached lower stop. 22nd of May, the Royal Norfolk and Suffolk Yacht Club. And so we went on our way around the Norfolk coast, across Outer Wash, past more wind farms, until Spurn Head came into view, and we picked up a target buoy to head up into the Humber Estuary. We were told to find ourselves an appropriate berth on the visitor's pontoon, which we did. The 23rd of May, the Humber Cruising Association, Grimsby. Our marinas have been chosen for two reasons, that they have fuel and that, except for Grimsby, they have 24-hour access in most sea states. Grimsby needs to be left on a free flow which starts at 7 o'clock in the morning and finishes at 11 o'clock. The Yorkshire coastline was beautiful and fascinating. It was sad that we were unable to stop at Whitby. The boat was hosed down and the coldest beers were found to lubricate our tonsils. The 24th of May, Sunderland Marina. Our journey up the Northumberland coast was a magical historical adventure. And then around the tiny North Berwick Harbour and up the Firth of Forth towards Edinburgh. We were to rest the night in Port Edgar, just under the magnificent Forth Bridge, near the very pretty South Queen's Ferry. What a magnificent structure that bridge is, and it seems impossible that it was commenced in 1882 and was opened in March 1890. This was an incident-free passage with as forecast weather, wind strengths and sea states, where apart from a slightly bumpy stretch past the Holy Island, everything went to plan. 25th of May, Fort Edgar Marina. The forecast is the best yet, with a slight sea state and a gentle following wind. We refuel and make our way back up the Orb of Firth, eventually turning north, past the estuary of the Firth of Tay, and onward up to Aberdeen. Peterhead is a further 23 miles on from Aberdeen. This was the simplest and easiest of passages yet. The 
The following day, having reviewed the weather, it was decided to take a break and go home. Peter heads the perfect marina to securely leave a boat for what might have been an indefinite period. The weather and sea forecast have remained on the side of just about OK for the 70 plus mile length across the Moray Firth to Wick. With this being the very top of the North Sea, with potential for northerly swells from beyond Norway and further challenging sea states from the moderate waves predicted, we were beginning to wonder about Scottish slight sea states, which seem to be less slight than we were used to in the Solent. Our passage to Wick was fascinating in that we encountered an enormous oil rig platform being towed and stabilised by three ships, which must have been around a mile apart. We heard a big whooshing sound and a massive windmill popped out of the fog. The 16th of June, Wick. The biggest day yet in a daunting sea passage sort of way had arrived. The Pentland Firth is a stretch of sea between Dunnet Head Cape Ness, Britain's most northerly point, and Duncansby Head, top right hand corner, and the Orkney Islands. It's approximately 8 miles by 5 miles and has its own scary sections in all published almanacs and pilot guides, and has been written about by every sailor of renown that has ever existed. All of the written advice is very much for the benefit of over optimistic pleasure boaters but particularly rag and stick sailors who might find themselves going backwards at seven knots in a 12 knot tide if they arrive at the wrong time. Without any control, the usually underpowered engines will have zero effect, culminating in them being delivered onto the men of May. Not a good idea. We were both really apprehensive about rounding the top of Scotland and the dreaded Pentland Firth. However, it was airily calm as we rounded Duncansby Head towards Dunnet Head and past the famous John O'Groats. I became a lot more apprehensive when Phil had to climb and descend a rusty, slimy 30-foot ladder during a fuel stop in Scrabster Harbour. Not once, but twice. Far off, we could see some cloud activity. As we got further down the track, there were ominous, darker clouds and banks of showers on the horizon it was decided to pull into Loch Erebel a few miles distant. This whole process has taken probably 90 minutes or so, and when we finally exited Loch Erebel, the sea state had reduced dramatically and the stormy weather had passed away to the east. We continued on to Cape Roth, which actually looks as severe as it's named. One hour later, we were alongside in Kinloch Burvey. The 19th of June, Kinloch Burvey. We set off with a moderate wind on the nose and a slight to moderate sea state. It was only 25 miles to Lockenburg and therefore, if we motored at a slow displacement speed, that is eight to nine knots, it would take us no more than three hours. 21st of June, Lockenburg. This was a 65 mile run where the first 35 miles or so would again be into the wind with promised slight sea state. After 35 miles, we were turned down past Gare Lock, where a neighbour in Lockenburg told us the sea states would noticeably reduce as we increasingly came into the shelter of the Isle of Skye. Back out into the very pretty Loch Alge to read up the tide times to see if it was going to be all right to go through Carl Rea and onto Malag some 15 miles distant. As we berthed, I turned around to be greeted by an enormous seal which almost jumped onto our bathing platform. Malag town was just 300 yards away with several pubs and restaurants to choose from and the marina had excellent facilities for yachts and motor boaters alike. We celebrated our good luck of arrival in this unscheduled harbour with a couple of cold beers. Later that evening I had Cullen Skink, the local smoked haddock and potato soup. Delicious. We like Malad.
The 22nd of June, Malag. The breathtaking vistas continued through the Inner Hebrides. The beautiful harbour of Tobamoy, with its brightly coloured houses on the harbour front, provided a picturesque backdrop for our refueling. And our spectacular journey continued across Loch Lenny to Oban. The 23rd of June, Oban. Our cruise to Port Ellen on the island of Isla, some 64 miles away, is mostly in sheltered waters, and in any event, the forecast is good. The 24th of June, Port Ellen, Isla. And so to Northern Ireland singing the obvious song as we passed the Mull of Kintar and continued down the northeast coast across Belfast Loch to Bangor Marina. The weather looked like it was going to become a little bit unfriendly over the next few days and that, coupled with Nigel and myself being expected to attend month end birthday celebrations back in Sussex, resulted in us travelling home from there for our second break from proceedings. Ninth of July, Bangor Marina. We are back on Start Me Up by 1 p.m. And although I thought we might not set off until the following day, the weather and sea forecast were perfect for us to leave immediately to Pool Beg Marina on the River Livy, Dublin. We arrived by seven o'clock after an incident-free passage over mostly smooth to slight seas into Dublin Bay where permissions are sought and gained from the port authorities to cross the main, that is, big ship channel to enter the very busy port on the south side, down a small boat channel, much the same as entering and leaving Portsmouth, and therefore out of the way of cruise liners, ferries and other huge ships. Dublin was everything I hoped it was. After a surreal evening dining in a rock and roll hotel overlooking the Three Arena and listening to a Stevie Wonder concert, courtesy of all the doors being wide open, we spent a fabulous next day touring the famous pubs, seeing the sights and visiting Trinity College University. The next day was spent walking around this compact city using the hop-on, hop-off bus route map as a guide. We of course ended up in the famous Temple Bar District, where we had a delicious Irish stew and Guinness at O'Donoghue's pub, which is historically famous for its association with the Dubliners, amongst other musical luminaries. Guinness does taste better in Dublin, according to Nigel. The 11th of July, Dublin. We move on to the diesel pontoon, which seems an extraordinary distance from the pump. I ask the duty manager how it works. Just reel out the hose and he guarantees it will reach. Nigel is dispatched to do just that, and indeed, after a considerable effort, it does just that. The pump at the tank end is given a couple of hammer blows by the duty manager, and the fuel starts to flow. Pool Beg Yacht and Boat Club was directly opposite the port and it was amazing watching these enormous cargo ships and cruise liners turning on their own length, literally 50 metres from our small marina. The cruise down to the southern Kilmore Quay was uneventful, although I was particularly apprehensive when it came to navigating through the rocky entrance to this delightful small harbour. Kilmore Key. There was safely only enough space for one boat and no way of knowing whether a boat was heading in. 
Kilmore Quay needs traffic lights or Harbour Master VHF permission. We had a wonderful crossing to Milford Haven, passing between the bird sanctuaries of Skoma and Skokko Island. down the waterway to lock into the very civilised Milford Marina. We dined in a pleasant restaurant overlooking the pontoons. July, Milford Haven. We, uh, here we go, it's a uh, Saturday morning, July the 13th, not Friday, not Friday. Not Friday. Yes. and um, we're now just leaving Milford Haven and Wales, bound for England, Cornwall, and Paddy's. Estuary is stunning and the white sand beaches of Polzef on the rock side, turquoise seas were beautiful. Five minutes later we were safe alongside the waiting pond and a duty manager called in on us. For various reasons, the gate would not be open for another 30 minutes or so. He only had a spot for us against the harbour wall itself, as all of the pontoon fingers were occupied. Although a beautiful tiny harbour, it was rather disturbing being gulped at by all the tourists sitting around the harbour wall as we secured the boat just below them. The 14th of July, Milford Haven. The wind is going round to a north-easterly direction, force 3 to 4, with a helpful tidal situation, which is perfect to get us down to Land's End, some 50 miles distant, on the back of a slight sea. When we make the final left turn of our circumnavigation, the north-easterly will be blowing offshore and should produce a flat sea for the passage to the Lizard, Great Britain's most southerly point. When we then turn north-easterly, the last few miles to Helford River, the wind and therefore the wave action will be on the nose, but hopefully still producing no more than a slight sea state. The seal gates were open, we slipped our lines and exited the inner harbour of Padstow. We made our way down a beautiful camel estuary, past the buoy marking the extremities of Doombar, and once out to open sea, set course for Land's End. Having passed some magnificent coastal scenery and maintaining 20 knots, two and a half hours later, we were rounding Longship's Lighthouse, one and a quarter miles off of Land's End and starting to make our way along the south coast of England. Shortly after, we entered Helford River and made our way up to the visitor area. We picked up a boy and broke out some cold beer to celebrate being back on the south coast, the familiar surroundings. The 15th of July, Helford River. It was my first visit to Falmouth, having previously only sailed round Black Rock at the entrance to the River Fowl. The splendid Falmouth Marina was huge and had the best washing facilities of the whole trip by far. The 
16th of July, Falmouth. We left our berth late morning and made our way up the Penryn River through Falmouth Harbour and exited the Fal Estuary. We made our way up the Cornish coast on the flat sea in perfect weather. It was only an hour or so to Foy, which I had visited several times before and knew the score regarding berthing. We decided to raft up alongside another motorboat where the owners and their friends were having lunch themselves. Nigel was dispatched to Foy Town Centre to buy some pasty. 45 minutes later we were on our way again to Dartmouth, heading directly from Start Point, but passing some significant harbours and holiday spots on the way. We had a great evening in Dartmouth, beginning at the Yacht Club, 200 yards away, and where, having purchased a token, we could use the showers the following morning. They gave us a friendly welcome at a range of great beer and an excellent restaurant. Another beer on the historic quay at Bayard's Cove. The 17th of July, Dartmouth. head off across Lime Bay and what can only be described as a glassy sea. The following sea state is picking up a bit on the back of a force fall. Less than an hour later, we are passing the Needles Lighthouse, cruising comfortably at 20 knots down the Needles Channel, past the first castle into the western Solent. Thirty minutes later, we are rafted up alongside another much older 37-foot trawler-style motorboat. 18th of July, Yarmouth. We are delighted to show Jackie and Poirot, the Brazilian husband, over starting. One hour after leaving Yarmouth, we came alongside Start Me Up's berth at Gosport. The marina having been worn of our return after two months. It was good indeed to be back home. Nigel had decided to go and get some bubbly from his favourite oldie supermarket. A short walk through the marina car park. He had aimed to do this in Yarn, but the £43 price tag for the ordinary cuvee on offer was not happening.
Peter arrives and the car consumes seven bags of stuff plus Nigel's electric scooter. We return to start me up and popped the cork. We toast the boat for delivering us safely around the shores of Great Britain. The engines did not miss a beat. Other than the plotter problems at the beginning of the cruise, everything had worked without any problem whatsoever. We toasted each other. Neither of us had ever lived in such confinement with another human being ever, let alone for the duration of this trip. We had managed to get all the way around without any falling out. We were the very best of friends at the beginning and the very best of friends at the end. We toasted Peter for picking us up and kindly delivering us back to East Sussex. Thank you, Start Me Up. You are the ballsiest eight and a half meter motorboat on God's earth and I love you.